I'm Michelle Zuby. And I'm Jacob Sadavoy. And this is our first speaker series for the text. And we're here with Dr. Tom Fabo. I'm very excited to be talking to him today about pro-social. Um, so Tom, if you can just give us uh, some background on what pro-social is. I, I might have to riff for a little while, but I'll just start by saying if you're familiar with Skinner's book, Walden 2, then you're familiar with what pro-social is about. Skinner had a vision, he had a vision of making use of the science of behavior to save the world. That was, I mean, he didn't write a book called The Behavior of Rats or Pigeons. He wrote a book called The Behavior of Organisms. And his intention in going into the laboratory was to uncover the basic principles of learning that could be scaled up to the cultural level, to the level of cultures, to help cultures develop processes that would work to keep them afloat for the long term. Now, he didn't have all the data for doing all that. So a lot of his work was interpretive. And Walden too was a riff on what it could look like to design a culture and actually live it. He wasn't a fool. He didn't think that we could do that on an international level, but he did think that it would be very useful for us to begin the process within small communities and then move upwards from there. He was a fan of Schumacher's book, Small, Small is Beautiful. And so he recognized that small intentional communities that were experimental would be the thing that would work for creating a culture that was based on the one out of our four basic contingency streams that is truly appetitive, and that's positive reinforcement. If you think about positive and negative punishment, well, they're aversive, but negative reinforcement is also quite aversive. We function in many of our situations responding to negative reinforcement contingencies. Positive reinforcement contingencies are the one out of the four in which we feel free. And the more we feel free, the more we're likely to offer positive reinforcement to others. What Skinner said is tantamount to love. What Skinner intended was that we started branching out from working with animals and working with communities and organizations and governments. I think that if Skinner was around today, he would look at some aspects of what organizational behavior management does as being extraordinarily extraordinary applications of the science of behavior. Other aspects of it, he may, if he were here today, look at and say, we've kind of unfortunately responded ourselves to the contingencies of reinforcement in ways that aren't helpful to everyone. We have developed interventions that serve the needs of the people at the very top of the organization and the stakeholders. And some of our OBM interventions have failed to address the needs. Sorry, I said, I meant the shareholders of the organization. And some of our OBM interventions, and I'm just as much responsible for this as anyone else, have failed to take into account the needs of the stakeholders. And it's that balance that I think Skinner would say we really need to address. And I say that Skinner would say that because Skinner was a student of biology. You know, his mentors in graduate school were not psychologists. His mentors were biologists, Henderson and Crozier, who were at the forefront of developing a brand new discipline, physiology. So they had him read their mentors. They had him read Ernst Mayer, for example who had written about evolutionary traps. Skinner wrote about evolutionary traps inside of 
science and human behavior. Or now what a trap is, is something gets developed at the level of the population. It becomes a trait. It is very, very useful. It is selected by it's the evolutionary advantages it confers upon the species that adopts it. The problem is, is that the environment changes and many evolutionary adaptations are slow to respond to the new evolutionary or survival contingencies that are out there. So we have a mismatch. You know, for example, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, we needed to store a lot of fat on our bodies. It was really important because we were out there in the wild hunting and gathering and there were periods of famine. And so it was important that we had large stores of fat on our bodies to survive those periods. Well, as science and technology progressed, we developed ways to get past those periods of famine. And now most of us sit in front of computers all day or have very sedentary lifestyles. We don't need those stores of fat anymore. But evolution hasn't changed our traits. And so there's a mismatch, an evolutionary mismatch. Now scale that to the level of culture. Cultures develop patterns of behavior that work for them for a period of time. The way Peter Turchin talks about it is that we come together and cooperate in order to establish unions that serve us well to get away from tyrannical social structures. And he called this imperiogenesis, when we come together that way. The problem is over time, then there becomes internal pressures. We start to, we start to fight each other internally. Conflict replaces cooperation. And we move from this cycle of imperiogenesis to what Peter Turchin calls imperiopathosis, where we start to fight internally. What prosocial is about is developing pattern by which we can modulate selfish and cooperative behaviors. Phylogeny has prepared us to do both, to both act selfishly and act cooperatively. But where acting selfishly, acting competitively serves the individual very, very intensely. And in an absolute way, you're, the individual is advantaged over all of the other members of a group if the individual competes very effectively. The problem is that the group then is disadvantaged by the individual's competitive advantage. It serves the individual in the short run. It doesn't serve the group, but it doesn't serve the individual in the long run. The individual is disadvantaged in the long run by the group not being fit. And so a group has a certain advantage to modulating the interests of the individual. The selfish behavior of an individual can be uh, modulated so that there is a balance between competition and cooperation. And that serves not just the group, but it also serves the individual for the long run. This happens at the next level of organization, social organization as well. So this group now is very fit and is acting very effectively. But if the individual, if the group acts selfishly for its interests, it will be highly advantaged compared to neighboring groups, which serves the group in the short run, but not in the long run. 
So you can see how this scales up to the level of groups, to the level of groups of groups, to the level of organizations, to the level of municipal governments, to the level of states, to the level of nations, to the global community that we all live inside of. I'm kind of like circling around and getting closer and closer to answering your question. I'm sorry for taking such a long time, but uh, so what we're really aiming at in pro-social is developing a set of procedures that helps to modulate out, to balance out the needs of the individual and the needs of the group so that we don't forego the long-term reinforcers of cooperation in favor of the short-term reinforcers available for intense competition. So I as always, a beautiful and eloquent explanation. Um, you know, I, I've done some some reading on pro-social and done a little work in pro-social, um, and it's 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 dense, right? The the concepts are um, a little complex. Um, it's something you really need to, I think, dive into to to really understand fully the evolutionary process, the efficacy of group dynamics. You know, all of the nuances of it. Um, and you and you did give a very nice overview, sort of of like the the evolutionary process of of pro social. Um, but for for those out there who aren't as familiar with pro social, um, if you had to give maybe like an elevator speech version of the importance of pro social and how we can use it, um, given the state of the world today, um, you know, we were just talking prior to recording about how a lot of these problems. These systemic issues, they've been there, right? These aren't things that just started happening. This isn't a 2020 issue. These are these are problems that have been going on for decades and hundreds of years. Um, but to look at it kind of like from a vantage point of where we are now and to have this, this pro-social um, technology and the science of behavior analysis, um, how can we use the science to, uh, to do better, essentially, to level um, the playing field between um, what you were just describing between the selfishness and the group cooperation so that um, people can just move forward more harmoniously, I guess is, is maybe a nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> Can't we all just get along? <laughs> I, well, there's, there's, I think, two things that are going to make a really big difference. One is that if inside of our organizations, we see ourselves as organisms, we see our organizations as organisms. And if we look at our organisms as being in need of self-management, then we can design our organism, our organizations ourselves. And we can elect to establish procedures that are loving. And when I say love, I'm using the word the way B.F. Skinner used the word. We can establish positive reinforcement contingencies inside of our organizations. This is critical. And I think that we need to look at ourselves as being in a constant process of organizational design, of cultural design. We tend to fall into passivity where we need to be proactive in generating cooperation. Now, the post-social process involves the establishment of a, pro a procedure to get groups thinking in terms of eight core design principles. The procedure involves acceptance and commitment training using the ACT matrix, which is a way of breaking down everything that all of us do in terms of our overt behavior, our covert behavior, and behavior that gets positively reinforced versus behavior that gets negatively reinforced. The core design principles involve identifying what's our what for, what's our common purpose, what would be a way of organizing our resources and our training so that everybody gets their fair share, equal in, equal out? How do we distribute resources? How do we make decisions? Everyone needs to be involved in decision-making, but not everybody needs to be involved in decision-making at equal levels. Let's develop a procedure for making decisions that's fair and equitable. How do we manage conflicts? 
conflicts between human beings are natural, inevitable, and not bad by themselves. Conflicts lead to growth and change. Conflicts are good, but how do we manage those conflicts so that they lead to cooperation as opposed to unbridled competition? Competition even is not bad, but unbridled competition can be bad. Likewise, unbridled cooperation can also be pathological. So we need to balance these things and make decisions about how we're going to make decisions and how we're going to manage conflicts. And then how are we going to manage productive behavior? How are we going to reinforce productive behavior? And how are we going to sanction non-productive behavior? Then what are we going to do about our relationships internally? Can we, inside of each one of our small departments within an organization or small focus groups within a activist organ, uh, an activist group, have some level of autonomy? Autonomy for the group that is within a larger group is really critical. And then how do we manage our relationships with other groups within our large group? And how do we manage our relationships with external groups? These are the core design principles that we use the ACT matrix to help groups begin to see, how do we do this? Oh, crap. How do we get in our own way? How do we step on our own feet? Oh, man. What is, and you can see that the way I'm talking about it is kind of flexible and kind of cute and fun. And well, that's the whole process. It's a very, very warm and uh, inviting process that once you get involved in it, it gets really fun. There's one more part though. All that is the first part. The second part is where I think behavior analysis really, really has something to offer. Contingency management. Organizational behavior management really provides us with a blueprint for project management in which we're able to identify who are the people who are going to get things done? Who are they accountable to? When are they going to start? By when are they going to have it finished? And who are they going to report to so that more goals and more procedures for accomplishing the goals can be built into the project management plan? You put ACT together with the eight core design principles of ProSocial and project management in an OBM sense, then you've got organizational behavior management 2.0. Love it. It's amazing. Um, so just for people out there who want to learn more, um, is there any work that you're doing, um, any work that you might want to point some people to, to look more uh, deeply into, to learn more about ProSocial and the process and what it might look like? Yeah. Uh, I'm the second chair of Commit and Act International. Commit and Act was formed 10 years ago by a German psychologist, Beate Ebert, and a Sierra Leonean social worker, Hannah Bokeri. Beate had gone to Germany. Uh, she had gone to Sierra Leone to do a ACT workshop and a and Hannah Bokeri came to that workshop and came up to Beata afterwards and said, would you help me start an organization? I wanna do what you taught us in this workshop with women who have been abused since the end of the civil war here. And Beata said, yes. They started this organization together and immediately started to make use of the pro-social model to build their organization and to help communities in Sierra Leone, West Africa, develop ways of being more productive, more fruitful, and more cooperative with each other. 10 years down the road now, we have a shelter for abused girls. We have a program for training couples to partner with each other more cooperatively. We have a program for teaching school kids ways to be cooperative and pro-social rather than violent with each other. 
In other words, we've done gang violence work and we've done gender-based violence work over the last 10 years using ACT and the pro-social model effectively with Commit and ACT. If you're interested in seeing how pro-social can be applied, check out our website, commitandact.org. The other place that you can go is prosocial.world, www.prosocial.world. You can find um, resources and studies that Paul Atkins and Robert Stiles have produced using the prosocial model. Those studies are not behavior analytic, they are more qualitative, but they give you an idea of how this can be done at a large scale inside of organizations and governments. My own research is much more small scale and applied behavior analytic, and that research is forthcoming. Fantastic, thank you so much. So insightful. Um, for somebody that's um, a new behavior analyst, potentially RBT or a new BCBA, um, and they're listening and they're fascinated um, what, uh, what skills um, do you think, or what access do they, do they need in order to um, start applying some of this with respect to like kind of what they're working on currently, um, especially if they're working in center-based programs or schools? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of different skills. I mean, one I think is facilitating um, pro-social workshops using the ACT matrix is a skill that can be taught, can be learned, can be refined, can be practiced so that you can get out there inside of a group and guide their change, their internal design um, processes effectively. There's a couple of different places where you can go to get that. Pro-social world is by far the biggest um, group that is training facilitators. And I should just show you this book that uh, Paul Atkins, Steve Hayes, and David Sun Wilson wrote on the pro-social process. And it is published by Context, uh, New Harbinger Press. I was going to say Context Press because that was the, the original name of the group. Um, and Paul Atkins is doing those trainings. I've coached inside of that, that framework with him and, and Paul and I are planning to put on some more workshops through Praxis. I'm gonna do some also through Connections. Uh, I wanna say Connections Behavioral Health, but I think that's wrong, it's Connections something. So there are going to be a number of different platforms from which to develop skills. I kind of focus uh, the, the trainings on pro-social that I do on the project management end of it, because I come from a behavior analytic framework. When Paul Atkins does these trainings, he focuses on the, um, the decision-making aspect, sociocracy, which is really, really awesome. You've just got to take his workshops in order to get a handle on that stuff. Dr. Sable, thank you so much. So insightful. Um, so grateful for you to, to be a contributor in the textbook, um, but also very thankful um, for your time here. Um, and uh, we can't wait for people to comment and be a part of um, the community that we're, we're establishing and ask more questions and be more adventurous with respect to pro-social acceptance and commitment training um, and everything that, uh, everything that you've shared. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, I, I realize I, I didn't prepare this. And so I kind of talked about what I'm currently interested in, like when I was talking about this uh, Imperio Genesis and Imperio Pathosis, Peter Church and stuff. I didn't really tell you about the origins of pro-social. I've talked to you about the most current stuff in it. Oh, well, I think it was fun. And I think that <laughs> uh, if you read the chapter, you'll get a little bit of that foundation that you didn't get inside of my talk here. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for your so time. much. Okie doke.